At the end of the review, I want to be able to answer two questions. Is the Octavia RS a future classic? And two, maybe most important of all, should you buy one? The Mark I Octavia RS was released in 2000, 2001, depending on which source you're using. The Octavia RS was obviously based on the Mark I Octavia platform, which had been available since 1996. The Mark I Octavia platform was based on the Mark IV Golf platform, which also did service as the base for the Mark I Audi A3 and S3 and Mark I Seat Leon. Out of all the cars that used that Mark IV Golf platform, Evo Magazine rated the Mark I Octavia RS as the best to drive and generally the best sporting VAG product of the time. The Mark I Octavia RS was the first Skoda model to use the RS VRS badging and its release coincided with Skoda's entry into the WRC for the 2000 season with Armand Swartz. At its first outing at the Monte Carlo Rally, it finished in seventh place, proving more reliable than the Focus RS of Colin McRae, the Impreza of Richard Burns, and the 206 WRCs of Panizzi, Granholm, and Delacour. With regards to the specs of the Octavia RS, it's equipped with a 1.8 20 valve motor, but not the 150 horsepower version used in the most Mark IV GTIs, but a 180 horsepower version which was using hotter A3s, hotter Golf GTIs and Borers with the engine code AUQ. Compared to the normal Octavia, the RS has got a lower front bumper, it has uh, white carpets, half leather bucket seats with white centre sections, perforated leather three-spoke steering wheel, perforated leather gear knob and gear knob gator, uh, silver gauge faces, rear wing, a modified front anti-roll bar, stiffer dampers, larger brakes, internal chassis stiffening for the rear suspension, uh, 16 or 17 inch alloy wheels depending on the year, and the aforementioned AUK 180 BHP motor. The 0 to 60 time was 7.9 seconds, top speed was uh, 235 kilometers an hour, 146 miles an hour, Curb weight of 1300 kilograms. On regards to the engine, it had a bore of 81 millimeter, stroke of 86.4. Uh, max torque was 173 pounds foot at only 1950 RPM. Uh, brake horsepower per ton was 137. The front brakes were 318 millimeters in diameter. And the combined fuel economy was 8 liters per 100 kilometers or 35 mpg or 29 mpg US. I've been driving this Octavia RS with 300 brake for about three months now. Let me get the worst things about the car out of the way first, and that is the, the suspension. I wouldn't say that there's a lack of grip or a lack of feel in the suspension. What I would say is there is too much movement on the springs. And this is from a car that's wearing new H&R springs and uh, new sax dampers. So that, personally, I don't like. It's like coming along here, there's just too much movement on the springs. I think it's completely unnecessary. But the grip is there. It's interactive. You can feel how much grip there is. It's not uh, an insulated experience. You do feel connected to the road. And it's not a bad experience either to put to punt this down the road. It's, uh, quite, it's quite nice. So the suspension's got its pluses and minuses, basically. What else? Regards to the interior, it does feel compact. It is a small car. It feels like a small car, which is, which is good and bad at the same time. Good because you feel like you've got room to place the car on an A-road. You're not constricted by the road. You can choose. You do have options with regards to your line. But with regards to comfort on a daily basis, it would be nice to have more space between the passenger and the driver. I think that's something that the newer cars have really got. I've got, they've gone in the right direction there with like a wide center armrest, you get more storage, you've got room for your cap holders uh, and you've just got a bit more space. You're not bumping shoulders with a passenger. Not that you're really bumping shoulders in this, but maybe you will, you will bump uh, elbows easily. With regards to everything else in the interior, my big, another big complaint I have is the speedometer. The numbers curve round, they're not flat, which is fucking ridiculous if you ask me. That is stupid. I would not mind changing these gauge faces at all. And um, plus they're not particularly clear uh, at night. They're not the crispest, they're not the crispest numbers. 
because the background also lights up a little bit along with the numbers which again is freaking ridiculous and it's not like Volkswagen Audi don't know how to do this because they do it on the, the Mark V Golf with a complete black background and white letters I think there's a lot of Volkswagen Audi creating uh, differences between uh, Volkswagen Audi and Skoda in this car they're deliberately not doing things as well as they could do to create that difference between Volkswagen and Skoda that is the feeling that I get um, in regards to everything else the window switches are okay mirror adjustments okay door mirrors are a great size adjustable interior mirror is nice doors close with a nice thunk you got a button to release the uh, fuel you've got uh, traction control which i think is very nicely judged uh, the seats are yeah they're decent they're not super cushy and they're not recaros like you get in the uh, mark 4 golf of the same era the mark 4 golf gti so again you can see them trying to make a differentiation between the two brands I'd say the center area, the center console here is basically the same as a Mark IV Golf. The engines are, are the same, the gearboxes are the same. I think there's good room in the back. If I'm not mistaken, I think I can sit behind myself with zero problems. It's got a massive boot. It's got a hatch so you can use all of the space back there. And it feels a solid car, touch wood. It feels solid, feels good quality. There are a few issues with this car, like known problems. Uh, the biggest one, I suppose, is the door lock mechanism. Not knowing if the car is open or closed, and not knowing if the locks are closed or not. And the uh, the recirculating flap on the Climatronic is also a known weak point. Uh, but apart from that, I don't. I think Touchwood they're pretty reliable on the electrical side. So that's the interior with regards to the steering feel. The steering wheel maybe it is a bit big maybe it could do with being a little, a little bit smaller like an inch smaller maybe but it feels good it's got perforated leather it feels decent maybe it's a bit of a plain design but it is a three spoke wheel which is nice the original gear knob on the car i'm not a fan of it feels hollow and light but this is not exclusive to uh this car generally i find all standard gear knobs like that so this one's been replaced with a carbon knob with a metal core, it's heavier, it's got a hard outer shell, much nicer feel on changing gear, much nicer. So that's the suspension, the interior, the steering feel as good as a hydraulic rack. It gives you, it's not like super transparent feeling on the steering wheel, but it gives the information, it gives all the information I need. I'm not left questioning is it gripping is it not it's uh, it's quite it's good good on the feedback and i would say maybe a step above well definitely a step above newer cars for sure would i change anything about the steering no not really i like it i like the rack i i'm not sure how many turns it is to um what do they call it to lock the lock but it doesn't seem that many i don't find like i'm having to turn the wheel an excessive amount on the road Perhaps it could be a bit quicker, but generally it's all right. I know people, I think people, I think people put Audi TT racks in here, but from what I can tell, that is, can be a major headache with uh, the stability control. So I'm not going to bother doing that. Uh, the gearbox, what to say about it. It's another weak spot with the uh, gear linkage. The bushes wear out in it, but there's no end of kits available to tighten up the shift. I've got a kit on order. I've seen what they're like when they're in good condition and the shift is very precise, very notchy, goes into gear really, really well. So I'd say it's a nice gearbox to use. They can handle a lot of power. Uh, this car's got the 300 brake apparently and I don't see any issues with it. The driveline seems beefy in general. I mean, you can't compare like a Primera GT drive shafts to this no comparison the the Vera GT uses chopsticks and this one uses tree trunks there's a huge difference so I don't think there's any issues there I think the brakes on this are great plenty of power plenty of stamina 
I've driven them quite hard over mountain roads if you've seen the other videos that I've done and I've seen absolutely zero hint that there's any problems with these uh, with these brakes at all it's a 318 millimeter disc which is you know a decent size uh, the, the calipers seem to have a decent size pad in them and the feel on them is uh, really good as well and then we come on to the engine which is I suppose is one of the main reasons anybody would consider this car the 1.8 turbo as I said this one is running a K0464 I put a link to a video about this a video specifically about this turbo and what it's like to use but I think the engine is nice it sounds great it doesn't sound harsh it's got a nice sound if you ask me I don't have uh, any complaints with the motor touch wood so far it's supposed to be a strong motor again touch wood decent response I don't think it's like a super laggy engine it seems fairly willing to rev out but there's no real reason to rev it out you've got a wide power band from about uh, three grand you generally into the power there and you've got power all the way around to five five and a half and the red line is I think six and a half around town I think the car is fine the steering lock is not the greatest I mean it's not absolutely horrendous but it's not the best either uh, on country roads I don't know, we've got so much traffic in front of us we've got a we've got a quick left and a quick right here look it turns in it turns in nicely it's got good feel I feel like I can tighten the line a little bit. It's not a crazy lift off over steery chassis, but lifting the lifting the throttle, it does bring the rear into action a little bit, a, a little bit. That body roll, for me, it becomes an issue, like more than a comfort issue, at at high speeds. So big corners at big speeds corners at 120 well 120 130 140 kilometer an hour plus corners that body roll is a problem it just there's just too much weight moving around for me to be confident in the chassis but for this stuff i mean we're coming around here in 900 I've got pl plenty of feel through the steering wheel. I say the chassis is. Um, I say the chassis is moving a lot. It's moving a lot on the springs, but that does make it super stable on um, on A roads, on bumpy A roads the, the chassis just absorbs it and actually now I'm talking about it it moves a lot at slow speed but when you pick up the speed the springs start to make more sense with regards to bump absorption it starts to plane if you like over the road or like at slow speeds it gets upset by the road <clears throat> but the faster you go the more the suspension starts to work and the body stays more on course online uh, but the engine I think is you know super peachy I love the sound of it it's got plenty of power it's got all the power I want the limit is really the the traction not that the traction control really comes on that much but it is a factor all the same it feels super boosty super boosty and it's not snappy either. it's not like no boost full boost the boost comes on you know slowly like you can ride it you can back off as it's building boost you can back off as it's halfway through building boost I mean, you've got you can modulate the boost 
really nicely with it. Now when I'm talking about the engine, I'm talking about it with a KO464 turbo on it. But as, as a standard engine, as a standard turbo, I find it a bit underwhelming. The cars that I've driven with a standard turbo, they feel good at, you know, low RPM, maybe two to three and a half, four. But they do feel a bit strangled from there on up. And it's a, it seems quite a, a short area of the power band where it's given a lot of torque. Whereas this seems to have, you know, a big line of, you know, big torque. So as a standard car, I th it's not, it's nowhere near as exciting to drive. But then again, on the other hand, you could argue that, like this turbo, like dominates the driving experience. I suppose it depends what you want. I'd say against the day's hot hatches, I'm not sure if like 180... 210 horsepower is really enough power to be exciting. Like this is a good example here. This is super bumpy, but you feel next to nothing once the once you pick the speed up. So if I can put all this together into like a nice compact summary, if you've got a standard Octavia RS, I think it's a nice car. It feels it feels a quality item. It's got it's got some character about it with the with the turbo engine. It is a bit underpowered, and the and it's not like a sparkling delivery with the engine. I mean, it's not nowhere near on the same planet as something like a K20. But as a nice, honest car, yeah, I think it. You know, it is. It's a nice car. I think it's a nice, honest car with a certain quality to it. You can tell where VW, Audi have done some stupid stuff to make the differentiation between the two brands. But fundamentally, you know that it's the same quality of stuff that's in the Golf and the Audi is in this car. For example, the door locks, the doors, the switch gear, etc., etc. So is it a modern classic? Is it a future classic, the Octavia RS? I think, yes, it is. And I'll tell you why. For, it's, got, it's got a number of different factors working for it. First of all, the 1.8 turbo motor. Anybody that's a fan of that engine, this, according to Evo magazine, was the best engine they ever put it in. That 1.8 turbo. So if you're a fan of that engine and you want to drive it in the best chassis it was available in, then this is the car to get. So that's one reason. You've got the fans of the 1.8 turbo that would buy it. Then you've got the fact that this car was the first car to wear the RS badge, the VRS badge from Skoda. So it is an important car, if you like. Then you've got your people who like old school cars, who like things a bit more compact. They like more of a challenge when they're driving. <clears throat> they don't want a white car. They want something compact on the road. And they want something with a bit of an old school feel. And I think this probably is going to be one of the better examples of if you like that older generation of car because of the practicality because of the engine because of the company that it's come from and it's got to be on the shopping list because it's also turbocharged as well and then i suppose you've got the fourth type of person that'll be interested in this car there's something looking for something cheap to run cheap to buy and cheap to modify and cheap to fix if it does go wrong now, i've done a video on that the best hot hatch under 5k and I think you're hard, you're hard beaten to beat this platform to tick all those boxes. So I think this, the car has massive appeal to many different people for many different reasons. So for all those reasons, I think this car is definitely going to be a future classic. And actually, I think it, I'd find it easy to make the argument that it is a classic already. The boxes that it ticks, like a th three box car. I mean, what have you got? Impressors, Evos, they're on a completely different level. And, you know, what other turbocharged cars are there? I'm not even, I don't even know what there is. BMW have got nothing. Audi have got nothing that's got a decent chassis attached to it, at least during this era. And then the question is, should you buy one? Well, let's say, if you're, if you're a member of either of those four groups, then it's either going to be absolutely because there's no other choice or absolutely definitely on the shortlist at the least 
but if on the other hand you don't you don't really want to buy into the uh, the old school feel the analog driving experiences you just want you know a 200 horsepower car that's practical for the least amount of money then I think really you've got to look towards sort of a mark 2 Octavia's uh, maybe the five door mark 5 golfs so that's the video if you're looking at mark 1 Octavia RS to buy and you weren't sure whether to pull the trigger or not hopefully this video has uh, helped you if you've got an op, Mark 1 Octavia RS feel free to leave a comment below about your car what you've done to it how you find it what you think I should do to this car to improve it etc etc I'd love to get some feedback that's it for now guys uh, be a video coming in about a week if you've enjoyed the video please vote on it if you're not a subscriber already please subscribe hit that notification button look after yourselves and I'll see you again in the next video